Uh, Longmont Urban Renewal Authority, today, October 29th, 2024, to order. Um, and we have a roll call, please. Chair Pett? Here. Commissioner Christ? Here. Commissioner Hidalgo Berry? Here. Commissioner Martin? Here. Commissioner McCoy? Present. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Yarbrough? Here. Commissioner McGilbright? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Commissioner Burkhold? Here. Commissioner Parker? Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we are now going to approve the well, well we're going to do the lower budget. budget I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to the Urban Renewal 101, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, oh, thank you. What time? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. We're, we're very excited to have this URA um, 101 training for all of you. Um, I have Two of my esteemed colleagues, um, Corey Hoffman and Steve Hart, um, who will be presenting. You will be hearing the legal side of urban renewal. And then Steve is the executive director of the Urban Renewal at Wheat Ridge, and he will be um, sharing some of these studies. So please take it away. First off, thank you very much for having us here this evening. Um, it's going to seem like Corey and I are running a million miles an hour when we make presentations, because we have 40 minutes to give you a presentation, we usually take about four hours. Mm -hmm. So we normally say those people in four hours are drinking from a fire hose, we're going to be dumping the whole Pacific Ocean into you today. So we want to encourage you to have questions. If, if it's pertinent at the moment that's something you think we missed, feel free to raise your hand and we'll answer any questions. If not, we'll hold questions to the end. The odds are you're going to have a lot more questions that we're going to provide you answers for this evening. But that's great, okay? Um, a couple of things, you do have one of the, the strongest attorneys in the, in the state and in urban renewal, knows everything about it. And that ends, you have a lot of neighboring communities around here that do urban renewal that are happy to help out your staff and anything they need. So feel free to utilize the services. Plus, you're also members of an organization called Downtown Colorado APCI that does formal one-on-one -on -one presentations. So between them, we will help you answer any questions that you want. The other thing that Corey has the most is because a lot of it deals with the legal end, and I'll just probably interject items in the uh, yeah. So our first slide. Awesome. There we go. And uh, good evening. And so for those of you that haven't met, I'm Corey Hoffman. I'm going to give you a quick journey um, so you know a little bit about me. Um, I represent cities and towns and urban and rural authorities. But in the urban renewal context, I also represent actually one county. Um, so to the extent there are other taxing entities, um, I do most of the work on the municipal side, but I do also represent um, Pueblo County as it relates to uh, Pueblo urban renewal projects. So um, I, I, I hope that gives me a little bit of perspective um, in looking at, at projects and urban renewal from all sides. Um, you also have in your packet uh, for those of you that suffer from insomnia, a memo from my office that you can use uh, as a takeaway from this will really go into a lot of the detail um, as we're going through this quickly. Um, but what is an urban renewal authority? An urban renewal authority is an entity created by a municipality, but separate from the municipality. Um, the technical term is it's a body corporate and politic. Um, the difference for what it's worth between an urban renewal authority and a downtown development authority, an urban renewal authority, the special fund is the special fund of the authority, so it is actually a separate entity, whereas a DBA, the special fund is actually a fund of the city. Why does that matter? Well, it matters in one large respect, which is urban renewal authorities, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in a little more detail, are not subject to tabor because they do not impose a tax. So TIF, which we'll also talk about later, is derived from the taxes of property taxes of all taxing entities, but it is not a tax imposed by an urban renewal authority. Next slide. So terminology matters. And in the memo that's in your packet, I go into a lot of detail about terminology. But an urban renewal plan is defined as a plan for a project. And if I were to have my community development hat on, I think of a project is across the street, there's a project that's, that's a hotel is being developed. 
Well, an urban renewal project is much larger. Um, it can be for a single piece of property, but it is often a larger area, and a project is whatever is occurring within the plan area. And each, let's assume that the plan area for downtown Longmont, for example, included across the street where the hotel is going in, and City Hall. If that were the case, what's going on across the street under the urban renewal law isn't a project, it is one undertaking or activity within a larger project area. Why does that matter? Because a project may have a whole host of things going on in the project area. And some of the undertakings and activities that urban renewal authorities are um, authorized to do, acquisition of property, demolition and removal of buildings, um, cleaning up environmental contamination, building public infrastructure. Uh, some urban renewal authorities will use the TIF that's generated to actually just build the infrastructure and allow private development to do the rest. There's a lot of different models in terms of how urban renewal authority, urban renewal can be used. No right or wrong way. Now, lighting conditions. In this context, nomenclature stinks because what you are have to prove is that property is blighted. And no one wants to hear that their property is blighted. That sounds like the scarlet letter of, um, of land use, but that's the terminology we use. And so there are uh, 12 conditions of blight. You typically have to get um, five of, four or five of them to um, Qualify as blighted. If the owner consents, you only need one. Um, examples of what are um, four of the following factors. Slum, deteriorating or deteriorating structure, predominance of defective or inadequate street layout, um, unsanitary or unsafe conditions, um, defective or unusual conditions of title. It's the things that make property not feasible to develop. Yes, it's not your grass is dead and your plants are gone. That's not why. It, it is something that makes it so the market will not allow property to develop, that it needs something more. And so to me, a contaminated property is perhaps the best example where the cost of environmental cleanup may make it so that the redevelopment of a property just doesn't tend to Um it, it may be that there is dilapidated buildings or dilapidated infrastructure that um, the market can't afford. And so it's oftentimes that kind of condition that urban renewal essentially fills the gap. And what can urban renewal fund? Um, there are a lot of different opinions, frankly, on what urban renewal can fund. I tend to be fairly conservative. Um, it's the types of things, again, I would go to environmental contamination, public improvements, but it's things that I would suggest to you are not specific to a particular type of use. So I'm gonna give an example. And again, there, this is one of those things where there's a lot of different opinions. But if I am um, utilizing urban renewal for a restaurant, a grease trap, can be used by any restaurant, by and large. A pizza oven can only be used by a pizza place. I would suggest to you a grease trap is a much better small version of what urban renewal can pay for, because if the tenant leaves, that property is still available and it's still eliminating blight, whereas a pizza place leaves, you've got a building with a pizza oven, single purpose. So better utilization would be something that is going to serve the property in a macro sense, not one particular user. Um, and then, in terms of the elements of an urban renewal plan, an urban renewal plan is a form, in my view, of a planning document. Um, it is a document that authorizes certain actions, but doesn't compel them. 
So tax increment is how, for the most part, that we're funding individual activities or undertakings. I'll try to stay to those terminologies, but sometimes we always slip in the same project. So let's say undertaking activities, and he always corrects me. So in a nutshell, tax increment financing is what we're going to use, and we're going to talk about that and the tip clock. What is tax increment financing? For the most part, what it's saying in this slide that we're showing there is the red line is what is called the base. Okay, when you form an urban renewal plan area, the county assessor will set a base for that plan area. Let's say it's a single parcel plan area. That hotel that's being built across the street, you formed an urban renewal plan area on there for that. And the county's going to say before any development come in and the property tax is $1,000 per year. And they pay that thousand dollars to the county and traditionally that county then will give themselves money the city gets some back probably your water district fire district whatever special districts are that you pay your taxes go to that by doing that development on there the property tax is now going to go to oh, it's going to go a lot higher but let's say it's eleven thousand dollars it goes from a thousand to eleven thousand dollars per year that additional ten thousand dollars that is generated is the increment so the t they will still pay that $11,000 to the county. The county will still take that original $1,000 and send it off to all those special districts. But that additional $10,000 comes back to the authority to help with those eligible improvements that Corey talked about to do those in there. It comes straight back to the city of Longmont to be used in the city of Longmont. That's the great thing about TIF. It's being used directly in your community. The base does go up every single year, as is indicated by that red line. So it jumps cost of living. Different, different factors will determine what it's going to jump throughout the year. So what you're trying to do eventually is to build up your TIF assessment. It goes for a period of 25 years. At the end of 25 years, the TIF clock stops. So when you form a plan, for the most part, on that day one, that 25-year plan will start generating increments. Okay, hopefully. The odds are it's not going to do it on day one because that development across the street isn't done. The development's going to get done. It then gets assessed. And then in the following year, pays property taxes. The following year after that, then you start receiving the property taxes from there. Um, and so at the end of 25 years, you will stop receiving increments. And that money then all goes back to those special interests of the county, the city, the school district, water things like that. Corey, please. A couple of things. The red line. I want to explain how the base goes up because the way TIF is generated is from what, what is known as redevelopment activity. So redevelopment activity is what, what creates the, the TIF. But not all increases in value are generated by redevelopment activity. So if there is increases in value in areas outside the urban renewal area, that's going to take the countywide values up. Let's say it's for inflationary reasons. If property is going up to 5% across countywide, that doesn't generate TIF. That goes to the increase in the base. Um, also, the Colorado Supreme Court told us that redevelopment activity has to be physical redevelopment activity. And so, when you think about a plan being approved, that tells the development of community and a market perception that the value should be higher, so the value will go up. We don't get TIF from that. It has to be actual redevelopment activity as opposed to the market perception that property is more valuable because it's in an urban renewal. So by doing TIF, by receiving TIF, by doing uh, development agreements on these activities and undertakings. Here's what we're, what we're ultimately trying to do. Is we're trying to just create a, a catalyst of development that's going to help not only that single activity and undertaking, but other activities undertaken in the area. Let's say you have that development across the street and it was multiple parcels. Um, and they do that redevelopment on the site there and the next door neighbor looks at the end and says, well now that they built this brand new hotel, my property looks deficient. It could use a real paint job. Well, if you're receiving increment in, and you haven't given 100% of increment to that hotel, you're able then to go to your neighbor and say, well, we have funds for you to help do some, a, a new facade improvement on your building. Um, so it's a great way just to create a catalyst of investment into not only that single 
activity or undertaking area with other adjacent areas around them. Uh, oh, this way, this way, this way. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this is really how TIF works. You, you have these blighting conditions that Corey talked about. You identify them. You're going to form that urban renewal plan that we may go into some sections later on there. Um, after development is done, you're going to create a better looking neighborhood. Um, you're going to remediate blighting conditions. And we and Reed, which we'll talk about a case study in a few minutes, um, that we talk about uh, brownfield cleanup that we did on the site there. Um, the TIF districts create it. The base value is set by your assessor. One of the things we say is become very good friends with your county assessor. No two county assessors in the state value base and increment in the same way. So you need to really get out and understand how they're going to do that. Uh, do that. And then ultimately, you're going to create uh, revenue from there, increase revenue. Corey, I think this is you, right? It, it is. And, and I want to uh, go back to something Steve said about. 25 years TIF clock because he's absolutely right. TIF is it's collected for 25 years. At the end of 25 years, the money that has been generated has to be pledged. It doesn't necessarily have to be spent. The money that has not been pledged has to be returned to the taxing entities that was property tax TIF on a pro rata basis. That does not include sales tax. So to the extent that the an urban renewal plan might authorize the use of sales tax, that doesn't have to be returned. It's only the property tax on a pro rata basis. Now, why use increment? Why use TIF? Well, um, I will be the first to admit that in the early 2000s, late 90s, there was a perception that urban renewal was going to be used. Um, and, and so I think when we talk about House Bill 1348, that was a reaction to that. But I think as the state is statewide looking at the tool, they're seeing there's absolutely in the post-1348 world good reason to use TIF. Why is that? It's not a new tax. It is redevelopment paying its own way through the increase in value triggered by that particular redevelopment activity. Um, it allows for TIF to pay for what I was referring to earlier, extraordinary public improvement costs, extraordinary um, environmental remediation costs, those things that but for urban renewal, the market wouldn't do. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the property tax rates paid by anybody to any of the taxing entities. So the tax rates stay the same. It is increment generated from redevelopment activity based on those existing tax rates. Um, and again, from a kind of, I think what folks like to hear, it's growth paying its own way. It's not, um, it, it is, not subsidizing in the traditional sense because it is providing those incentives from dollars that are generated within the urban renewal. And these are examples of um, ways in which that gap can be filled. And, and often what most communities do is they will have, they will have the assistance of an economist. So WeBridge, for example, uses economic planning systems, or EPS. And what they do is a feasibility analysis. And they, they, they run the numbers from a developer to determine, you know, are, are their numbers reasonable? Um, is there truly a gap that but for urban renewal assistance, the project wouldn't go forward? And they, they, they allow, for example, that, yes, there is a, a profit for a developer, a developer's taking a risk, but they want to make sure that profit is consistent with what the market would allow for, but for the challenge of whatever is triggering the need for urban renewal. All right, we always like to give you a little humor and stop right up. Any questions on the first 10 minutes that we have presented to you? 15. We keep moving on. All right. So someday this will all be infrastructure which is what urban renewal really does. It's eligible improvements, as Corey continues, tells me, is what we do. It's eligible improvements in there using the but 
or proposition. So I want to take a step back because in Longmont, <coughs> I think it's important to know what the city council does and what the urban renewal authority does. Because while the city council is wearing two different hats, you certainly have different functions. And so it is the job of the city council to make the policy. How is the policy made? The policy is made by adopting an urban renewal plan. In order to be able to adopt an urban renewal plan, the city has to first find the property is in fact lighted, which is done through what's called a condition survey, which is again a consultant looking at property and seeing if the elements of light that I mentioned before exist. And it is the city that ultimately approves that light study. And if blight is found, then you're authorized to adopt an urban renewal plan. And that urban renewal plan is a plan of the city. It is a living, breathing document, a policy document, in my view, of the city. So what's the job of the urban renewal authority? The job of the urban renewal authority is to implement the plan of the city. Um, and so you really do wear a different hat. For example, an urban renewal authority has typically one public hearing a year. That's the budget. Um, that is the only public hearing an urban renewal authority has to have, which is under the local government budget law. Everything else, frankly, is implementing the plan. It is looking at redevelopment proposals and ultimately considering whether to approve them. Um, Done in an open meeting, done in public, but the job of the Urban Renewal Authority is to implement the Urban Renewal Plan, which is through any variety of types of um, agreements. So there's, there's a lot of models on how Urban Renewal Authorities might implement the plan. One way to implement the plan is to build infrastructure and then have the, the property ready for private redevelopment. Another model is to partner with other taxing entities. Um, in the city of Aurora, for example, there is often um, the city, the Urban Renewal Authority in Aurora, will enter into agreements with metro districts, where metro districts will be responsible for building the improvements, and Urban Renewal will pledge the TIF to offset a portion of those costs. Another model is that the developer fronts all the costs, and then is reimbursed over time from increment. And so all of these models have one thing in common. If increment isn't generated from redevelopment activity, there isn't money to spend on the redevelopment. So the city isn't at risk, the urban renewal authority isn't at risk, because the agreements only pledge that revenue generated by the redevelopment activity. So from a risk assessment perspective, on behalf of the city and on behalf of the Urban Renewal Authority, it's really, really low risk because the developer takes the risk of doing the redevelopment and the Urban Renewal Authority says we're gonna pledge that revenue that is generated from that redevelopment. So wait, Corey, you said you're gonna give me a million dollars over the 25 years, because that's what I said I'm gonna generate an increment. I only generate 800,000. I can come back and sue you for the other 200,000. Nope. No, you can't do that, huh? Okay. I, it's what, what I earned. Okay. Uh, go back to that. Oh, sorry. And so, um, under, uh, in terms of um, adopting an urban renewal plan in the post 1348 world, um, there is new members, four new members, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in terms of the process for adopting an urban renewal plan, before the city council can consider an urban renewal plan, the urban renewal authority, if it already exists, and in this case, in one one it does, is tasked with negotiating with all of the taxing entities that impose a mill levy, an agreement prior to city council adopting the urban renewal plan. 
the purpose of that agreement is to share the increment generated from the redevelopment activity based on the impact of the various taxing entities on services. Um, Longmont has its own fire district or fire department, which makes it a little bit easier in Longmont than it is in other communities because, frankly, fire districts believe they have the biggest negative impact caused by urban renewal. For, uh, urban renewal. I would respectfully disagree. I think, frankly, that if you take an old building and, for example, sprinkle it and redevelop it, redevelop it you're going to have less calls for service. But historically, fire districts struggle with urban renewal because oftentimes you're taking vacant or underutilized properties and developing them, and fire districts see that as causing more impacts, and their sole source of revenue is typically no levies. But the negotiations with whether it's the county, whether it's the special districts, um, is about impacts on services. And I will tell you that, um, for example, in Weld County, in Weld County, the commissioners have a policy where you, they essentially say they want 50% shared back as a condition of um, working with a given municipality on urban renewal. And they may request that it be done, be um, pledged to certain improvements. So in Erie recently, they approved a plan along I-25. And part of the negotiations with Weld County ended up that the, the Urban Renewal Authority agreed that, that those dollars generated from the Weld County TIF would go to certain public improvements. And that's the give and take of negotiating with the taxing entities as part of Urban Renewal. Also, before an Urban Renewal Plan can be approved, it has to go to the Planning Commission for conformance with the city's master plan. So the only thing the Planning Commission is looking at is does the urban renewal plan, as proposed, conform to the comprehensive plan of the municipality? They get 30 days to make a decision. If they don't make a decision, it is deemed approved, or deemed consistent and in conformance with the urban renewal plan, or with the, I'm sorry, with the master plan. And then it goes to a public hearing before the city council. And when the city council considers the urban renewal plan, they're defining, it's a defined plan area boundary, a legally described area, because ultimately the assessor has to know that property is in urban renewal because they divide it between base and TIF. The treasurer has to know who to send checks to. Um, and then it, it authorizes TIF. It may or may not authorize the use of eminent domain. I would suggest to you that in the last 10 or 15 years, I don't think urban, uh, eminent domain is a tool that has been utilized by urban renewal authorities. It's there to be utilized if necessary. I think now it would be used mostly for, if you have, let's say, um, 10 or 11 property owners that are an assembled property, you have one property owner that has what I would call a drug strip. That might be the type of um, use of eminent domain in the urban renewal context, but exceedingly rare. So, in 2015, effective January 1st, 2016, House Bill 1348 was adopted by the legislature. It did a number of things, but I, I would suggest there's probably three things that were the <coughs> biggest parts of 1348. The first is adding new board members. So if you have a new plan or you substantially modify an existing plan after January 1st, 2016, that triggers House Bill 1348. And so in terms of membership, it compels the Urban Renewal Authority to add three members plus a fourth that is appointed by the city. The three members are a member that is a representative of the county, but need not be a county commissioner. So the commissioners can 
appoint someone who is or is not a commissioner. The special districts agree, agree on a member that is within one of the taxing entities, one of the special districts. That member has to be an, a, a member of the body, a member of the special district. And I know there was a question. We use the term elected. What that means is it has to be a, an actual member of the special district. It can't be someone that is not on the body. Likewise, with the school district, it actually has to be a member of the particular school district. So only the county is authorized to appoint someone who is not a member of the elected body. And then to keep an odd number of members on the urban renewal authority, there is a fourth member that's appointed by the mayor with the consent of the governing body to keep that odd, odd number of members. So that's the first thing that 1348 did. The second thing is to compel the negotiation that I referred to earlier. If there is an inability to reach agreement, House Bill 1348 has a mediation provision. And so you have 120 days, or shorter or longer if you need it, to negotiate with all the taxing entities. If you reach an impasse, then you have the ability to um, send it to a mediator or a body of mediators. It'll be either one or three, depending on if the parties can agree on a mediator. Um, and the job of the mediation is to determine the impact on services, make a decision, and then that decision is ultimately part of the urban renewal plan. Um, I was, depending on your perspective, lucky enough or unlucky enough to be the chairman of the first mediation body after House Bill 1348 um, passed for Leadville. And I would suggest to you the decision mattered less than the delay associated with it. Um, it took ultimately, it probably added a year, ultimately, the timing in terms of getting the mediate, selecting the mediators, getting the mediation set, and then a decision being. So there is a strong incentive to try to reach agreement with the taxing bodies. And then the third piece is what we referred to earlier, which is confirming that to the extent that dollars are not pledged at the end of the 25 years, that the property tax is returned on a pro rata basis to the taxing bodies. I think I probably covered everything on this slide. <laughs> then we have the last part there um, about the, uh, uh, the money needing to be designated. That's up to that urban renewal folks to make sure that we're not just kind of going, oh, we're going to do this. And, and when you look at undertakings and activities, um, I think it's going to be rare that money is returned on a pro rata basis. Um, in my experience, urban and rural authorities, you know, the, the TIF clock is 25 years. But urban renewal, once you create the plan area, is not limited to 25 years. Because I would suggest to you that remediating and maintaining those areas is a continuing obligation. If you say we're going to, you build something, and you say, we're good. Where are you going to be in 15 years? You're going to be back where you were at the beginning. And I can give you kind of, so I, I like to use the North Glen Mall as an example. Um, full disclosure, I'm the city attorney for North Glen. Um, my first project in North Glen was working on the old North Glen Mall. And so right now at 120th and I-25, you have the North Glen Marketplace. Well, that was one of the first power centers when the mall came down, an urban renewal project. 25 years for that project elapsed last year. You know what? If you look at that area, and you look at the empty space, you look at you know, borders leaving, and sports authority going out of business, and power centers not being the thing anymore, Will North Glen someday look at whether they have to look at that area again? They probably will. Um, 
but retail cycles um, are one are one timing issue. But what happens to a property over time? That property is going to be really difficult to redevelop, and frankly, power centers are not the thing anymore. So, what will they do in the future? I don't know, but we're going to be looking at some point at a third generation, I suspect, in that area. Um, but as that 25 years winds down, you want to look at what the needs are. Are there infrastructure needs? Um, are there long-term maintenance needs to assure that the property doesn't deteriorate. So in my experience, there's not going to be a lot of money at the end, if any, because you are looking at making sure to um, continue to remediate, as opposed to just saying, okay, we throw the money out and we're done. So you mentioned the frequency. I think it's a minimum of once a year to get the budget. Um, but if our plan is to execute plan, I just isn't it hard to believe it once a year is enough? Absolutely. So what's, I mean, what have you seen in terms of frequency? So is it just so I, I represent the Arvada Urban Renewal Authority. They have meetings once a month like that. Um, we bridge, I would say, on average, once every six weeks. Yeah, as the year. Um, it's going to depend. Um, the more active, the more potential projects there are, the more need to meet. Lakewood after Belmar did nothing for years and really only met once a year or two to put their budget and all their and more activities going. Is, is there a limit to how many projects are currently in Lakewood? You've been working on 20 things in Lakewood, so. Absolutely. And do you have separate budgets for you? Yes. Well, so you have a separate special fund for each urban renewal area. But one urban renewal authority budget. So if you have multiple urban renewal areas, you'll have one budget and a special fund for the downtown plan area, for example, a, a different special fund for a different plan area, but all under the urban renewal authority. I attended a meeting out in rural Colorado with a community that has five urban renewal plan areas and they've been going for a long time. They just take all their increment and threw it into one account. I was like, you can't do that! Because <laughs> you have to, at the end of the day, Monies that are generated in one plan area have to be used in that plan area unless you can draw a nexus of why you're using it outside that. Uh, and, and, I, and I would just say when we talk about why House Bill 1348 was adopted in 2015, um, urban renewal is not an economic. Will good urban renewal generate economic redevelopment? Absolutely. But it's not intended to be an economic development tool. It is, attempt, it is intended to be a blight remediation tool. And as a result of that blight remediation, you will often have things like job creation, things like economic development, things like increased tax revenue. But the purpose of urban renewal is to be well, right now there are two urban renewal areas <clears throat> established in the uh, city. One is the Twin Peaks Mall urban renewal area, the other is the Southeast Longmont. So within those boundaries though, there's a possibility within the next year there could be two or three, I guess, Projects, undertakings, undertakings, <laughs> uh, undertakings within those boundaries. Uh, so first, the main will be definitely one of those that we'll be looking into. Um, there's been talk if the sugar mill is at, or sugar factories annexed into the city, that could be another activity. So there is a possibility over the next two years, uh, several undertakings. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, in the southeast, area. huh? In the southeast. Area. We actually may have one in the Twin Peaks area too. So, I mean, if our goal is to eliminate, is there a list that can be shared with this board? There's the current light studies that have been performed in terms of prioritizing that. Well, there would be two light studies right now. If there are two plans, you would have two light studies in your files. And I think it's also important, Corey, to 
advise or, or note that blight studies, if they haven't been done for several years, there's an update requirement to do some of these undertakings. So it, it's going to depend because right. if, if you're going to use eminent domain, you have to update it. Right. If the clock is already started, you don't. Yeah. So. And, and just to let you know, both of our urban renewal plans only allow for eminent domain upon consideration of the city council. So the urban, there's nothing in the plan that gives the authority to condemn the property by the authority directly. So there are the blighting factors, and that's in Corey's memo that he gave you that shows all the blighting factors. Your plan doesn't mention any specific blighting things like, we want to take the corner a third and da da da, and this will, it's a 50,000 foot level. That's why you have an attorney to say, all right, can we consider this to be blight? Um, we just purchased a brand new patio in front of one of our retail businesses. We're trying to get people on the street. Oh, is that an eligible improvement? Yeah, it is. It's bringing more people to the street. It's, it's providing them a comfort level. It's providing them safety from traffic. They're traditionally ran right next to that building. So, it's an eligible improvement that we're able to do. So, it's pretty vanilla. What you want to do, they don't get into specifics. Let me get back and answer. We have one that's active in terms of financing, and Jim prints the building fees. And so that's the one that we have to sign this one. Oh, thank you. But I just clarified so that's an urban renewal area, but we only have a small section of that that currently is generating tax increment. Which is the village itself. Right. Yeah. And then, just like the city, Florida is subject to it's a local public body. So, the open meetings law applies. So, the same thing about having to meet by an email. <laughs> um, all of the rules that you are familiar with in terms of what it, open meetings, the ability to go into executive session if it qualifies for an executive session, same thing. Um, urban Renewal Authority records are subject to the Open Records Act. So, um, it, in that respect, it is just like any other local government or local public body subject to the same rules. Um, again, adoption of bylaws, not required by the Urban Renewal Law, but most Urban Renewal Authorities have them. Um, and, you know, it, it, a lot of this depends on whether it is the city council, as it is a long line acting as the urban renewal authority with the, the additional members or not. Um, and there, there's, there's two models, but neither one is right or wrong. Um, those communities that want the city council to act as the urban renewal authority look at it as we want to be accountable to the voters. And so whether we're wearing our urban renewal hat or our council hat, we want the same level of accountability. Those that have separate bodies, it's the same idea, but reversed. We want you not to be subject to election, to be a separate body so you can make the hard decisions and not have to worry. Um, you're still implementing the plan of council, but to the extent things may be unpopular, there's that level of separation, but you're still implementing the plan of council. No right or wrong, just two different ways of looking at it, and both are authorized by Colorado law. Corey, could you also give us some information or advisement on IGAs between the city and the authority? Absolutely, and so it is um, certainly common to have um, an intergovernmental agreement that talks about, for example, use of city staff. Um, you know, in Parker, the Urban Renewal Authority, the agreement between the town and PAR, which is the Parker Authority for Reinvestment, allocates certain monies to pay for um, town staff to put the redevelopment hat on. It actually pays for rent for portions of town hall to when you have your urban renewal function. Um, in Parker, they do, as I mentioned, they do a lot of um, infrastructure. And so the, the IGA accounts for using town staff to do project management. And so the idea is that you can utilize TIF to um, pay for city resources that are doing the urban renewal function. Um, in addition, you know, the, the cooperation agreements that are required 
um, under House Bill 1348, and those are forms of intergovernmental agreements. There's also specific authorization in the Urban Renewal Act to enter into IGAs. The Urban Renewal Authority is like any other government in that respect. It can contract with other governments to further the plan of the Urban Renewal Authority. To you, to a quick question for you. I see Wes, and Chris, and Jim. Uh, they're represent, Jim's representing the school district. You two are representing just the community, right? Who's special district? Special district. He was appointed later. Who is who is who's the county person that's supposed to be? Um, I can respond to that. So the county assigned one of their staff from the finance department, or actually, I think the person now is from the manager or their managerial office. Today. They did not make it tonight, yes. And, 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 for, and for what it's worth, in, in long runs, I understand you're in two counties, right? If you were ever to have a renewal in both counties, the counties would have to agree on one member. So Aurora has Adams and Arapahoe, and Adams and Arapahoe have to decide amongst themselves who's going to be the member because they have projects in both counties. And, and I can tell you, Weld County acquiesced to Boulder County because presently all urban renewal activity, foreseeable activity, is in Boulder County. And so my last slide <clears throat> is, is a lot of what I talked about in terms of the difference between the city and the urban renewal authority. So the urban renewal authority's role is to Council's plan. To negotiate tax increment agreements if there is a desire to adopt new plans. While TIF is the primary source of revenue, urban renewal authorities can go out and get grants and get any other sources of revenue that might be available. And so, from a budgeting perspective, when we talk about returning the property tax has been generated pro rata. Well, oftentimes what urban renewal authorities will do is pay that property, pay their obligations out of the property tax first. If the money left in the budget is stuff that has been generated from grants or from sales tax increment, it doesn't have to be returned at the end of the 25 years. It can be used to continue to remediate blight. Um, and these are all examples of the types of things that an urban renewal authority can do, but that Last bullet point is critical. It is not a taxing entity. So it can't impose a property tax. And if an urban renewal authority determines to issue bonds to um, whether it's for infrastructure, whether it's for any other purpose, it does not have to get voter approval because it's not a tabor entity. And the what is pledged to those bonds. Is tip. And so those bonds are, again, supported by TIF, but not by city. All right. Corey's talked about all the legal stuff that he takes to bed with him every single night and has to stuff. I get to do the fun stuff. So I'm going to talk about a little case study that we did. Anyone who's been in this area for a while may have bought a car at Johnny Harper Ford or John Elway Ford down at Wadsworth and 38th Avenue. Uh, the business closed down in 2008 before I started with the city. Um, was an empty lot, and everyone in the community, what the heck? What the heck was not the word they were using. Are you going to do with that corner there? So that was really my first activity that I was given to find a developer for that corner. Um, we went through quite a few developers uh, when I first started with Wheat Ridge because Wheat Ridge was formed as a non-growth community. I would contact developers and then say, not only no, but again, heck no. I'm not going to develop a new version. I never will again. It took me a while to find a developer to take a chance on our community based on our availability to have urban renewal on that piece of property there. So, on the top left is really what the uh, property looked like um, when I took it over. So, you've got this is uh, Wadsworth Boulevard along here, 38th Avenue along here. This is the Ford dealership. This was their future site development that obviously never developed into anything. Um, this is what the developer came to us and proposed to build. Needed help with it. Site had poor drainage. Most of what the site had was contamination. At one point up in a building up in this corner here, there was a dry cleaner there. And back in the old days when a dry cleaner, you, were, you know, you came there and had a stain and you rubbed this on there, they'd take that stuff and 
poured out of the back door. And that creates contamination there. Again, our role as urban renewal is to remediate blighting conditions, not to make money. So ultimately, to clean up that site cost me almost $3 million. Because has anyone cleaned up a site here before? Your board's always going to ask you, Tony, what's it going to cost us? And the answer is, I don't know. Because you never know what it's going to cost. It costs us $3 million to, to clean up the site. And we sold to the developer for $342,000. Yeah, you say, uh, my role isn't to make money. I cleaned up a site that was potentially going to contaminate the rest of the community there, get into our drinking water there, and affect what's happening in Weaver Ridge. I cleaned it up for our citizens. We cleaned it up. The board did for them. We didn't make money off it, but ultimately, we provided a clean site there. Um, so what happened was the, uh, the this was the original proposed concept that they were going to bring in and build on the site there. What they needed after we did a third party independent study of their performer was that they had a gap of about $6.2 million. We were going to do that in property tax and sales tax um, in there. So we have an agreement. We have written in our plans that we can go to the city council and say, look, they're going to generate sales tax on here. We'd like a portion of that back. City council agreed that they're giving us one and a half cent of our three cent local sales tax back every year until we complete that obligation of $6.25 million or 25 years, whichever comes first. Um, they also had a PIF on the property there. That PIF is included to help pay back that $6.25 million. Does everyone know what a PIF is? Yeah. Public oh, improvement fee. So they have to put all the public improvement in, kind of like a metro district in a way. So they put all the improvement in. Um, you pay when you go in there, you pay a one cent PIF on every purchase you buy. Of the, it's kind of goes, it's added on after the sale, uh, before the sales tax is added on, and it helps to just pay back. That infrastructure, they put public improvement fees. It's a city improved uh, thing. It has nothing with urban renewal. So urban renewal will never have to do with it. But we allowed because they were getting that money back that we were reducing that from our uh, obligation six point two uh, million. Again, we're giving her six point two. We were able to drive what's happening with the site there. So we had certain sales tax generation. <coughs> we want these four hundred dollars per square foot that you're going to generate on the things you're in there. So we're not going to have. Someone that's coming in is going to have a workout facility. Not creating much sales tax, all maybe a t shirt here, a little weight there. In there. Had to bring in stuff that was going to create sales tax. We had an original Lucky's grocery store that in there. Kroger backed out of backing Lucky's. Lucky's went out of business. They had to come back to us after two years of searching for someone to replace the Lucky's with another grocery store. Couldn't do it. Had to amend our agreement to say, okay, we're from that site. We're not going to allow, make you have to have that amount of sales tax. It's now a pickleball facility. So it doesn't create much. But it also. Indoor. So it's not indoor. for your neighbors. Yeah. Indoor. <laughs> <laughs> so again, they're probably never going to reach $6.25 million because the grocery store was their large sales tax producer on the site there. So it doesn't really matter. They don't hit it at the end. Yes. They get what they get on that. Um, so the big thing in any urban renewal uh, activity or undertaking you do is allow for flexibility. When that plan first started, there was a housing component to it. It's now 350 units of multifamily housing. Originally, they wanted to build 50 or so townhomes. If we would have written into the agreement specifically, 50 townhomes to be built here, we would have gone off the project. We just said a multifamily component would go, or a, a housing component would be part of that development area. So over time, a project development activity changes. Yeah. Just to get so you're able to give them parameters and what you're Yeah. And does the public have any ability to bring in on that? Coral that you that is up to your yeah. manual authority. We don't have no one shows up at our meetings. <laughs> it, it's great because we do things right. I mean I think we are the, I, I would I would argue that probably besides Denver, I bet you we have more urban renewal activities and undertakings than any other the state. We are a very active or giving grants, giving TIF deals. We've done a lot of development around the town because that's my job. I go out and generate that stuff that happens. And people now want to develop with this population of 34,000. And, and for what it's worth, Weaverich had to regain the trust of its community because it had a, a plan area in the mid to late 2000s where they were reporting to close Casman's, which was the, the oldest um, auto repair store 
and it was very unpopular, urban renewal stopped for a number of years in Wheat Ridge. And I think the first project that kind of regained the trust of the community was using the tool on Wheat Ridge Cycle, which was an iconic um, business in Wheat Ridge. And I think that helped regain the trust in the city and now the tool is being used. Urban Renewal Authority was formed in the late 1980s. The first activity was with Weaver Cycling in 2006 ish, or ish, maybe. Ish. So it did nothing for a long time. So the trick is get the activity right, okay? Just make sure you do it right. Like I said, we had to clean up one of the sites there. Um, but at the end of the day, we have something that was very popular. What lessons we learned? Um, so within the development, the developer showed up one night and he said, I got a great user. We're going to bring in a Walmart neighborhood grocery. The community got a hold of the word Walmart and went crazy. The city's giving six million dollars to Walmart to build a brand new Walmart. Is that what you're reading? No, but it's a grocery store. We weren't giving to them, we're giving to the developer. It led to a whole ballot initiative. Long story, you can look it up on the internet to do that. Public park. Yeah, in North Gun, it was used for a neighborhood Walmart, never was thrilled. So it really depends on your community sentiment. And it was one person who was driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, please. You still have the board meeting. I mean, you have two minutes. Okay. I'm done. I'm all done. I got him down to my I second last slide. Okay. Um, public participation. Someone asked about that. Do public participation. Um, make sure you structure the deal correctly. Um, that, that is beneficial for both the developer. And people will say to me all the time, you know, it's just the developer in there to make a ton of money and walk. And, you know, it's like, yeah, they're going to make money, but that's what America's kind of all about. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, we're, they're, they're allowed to pay off their, their uh, people at the end of the day. Uh, we also had COVID impacts, but I think that impacted everyone. So my very last slide is your partners in negotiations. Again, get to know your county assessor, get to know your developers, get to know your community, understand the performa. So it's going to be your staff that's going to create the performer. You're going to authorize them and allow them to do that. To do that. It's not, you, it can be your job, but really allow your staff to do the bulk of the work, to do the heavy lifting for you, to bring it back for you. Um, and then developing the agreement, how are you going to do this at the end of the day? And as we leave, have, that's what we have. What in accord? Good. Good. Good job. Fantastic. Um, do we have any comments or questions at, at the uh, end of this uh, presentation? No? Say no? Okay. Can you just all wish Jane a happy birthday? Because she agrees to help with the baby. Oh, I know. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I want you to go. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That was fun. Okay. We well, thank you for that presentation. We are now going to approve the Laura Brunton budget. So uh, it's on the very last page of this. I need a motion to. Uh, approve the resolution to adopt the resolution for the 2025 operating budget for Laura of two million four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So moved. Second. It's been moved by yep. Jim. Seconded by Chris. Um, uh, are there any questions or comments about this budget? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed. Okay, that was even quicker than mine. I know. Okay. It was About three minutes quicker. <laughs> so that passes uh, unanimously with no, what's it unanimous? Is there somebody missing? Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I believe, is the name. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So it was passed six yeah. to one to zero. Was there six people here? No. How many people voted? I know. 10 to 1. 10 to 0. 1 to 0. With Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah. And we move the adjourn. Second. I can see you. I can see you.